You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I've been doing commodity investing for 25 plus years, and I've never seen a situation like this where a commodity is making a new all-time high price and the level of apathy or disinterest in the sector, the mining shares, or the sector in general being so low. That tells me a few things. One, it speaks to the magnitude of the opportunity. You are listening to MSE. I'm Bill Powers. Thanks for tuning in. In today's show, we're going to be speaking with a strategic resource investor and board member in the junior resource uh, space that we haven't spoken to in a few years. I'm speaking of Michael Gentile. Michael, welcome back onto the program. And let's just jump right into it with the gold price and the gold stocks. Many are saying that the gold stocks are historically undervalued considered, considering the all-time high uh, price in the price of gold. However, others are pointing to the fact that there is depleting reserves and shrinking margins even as the gold price rises. So how would you reconcile these two things? Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot to, we'll get to see again, Bill, as well. Uh, there's a lot in that question to, to unpack there. I would say I've been doing commodity investing for 25 plus years, and I've never seen a situation like this where a commodity is making a new all-time high price and the level of apathy or disinterest in the sector, the mining shares, or the sector in general being so low. That tells me a few things. One, it speaks to the magnitude of the opportunity. We mentioned the undervaluation of, of the equities versus gold prices. There's a lot of great charts uh, flying around on Twitter, I see I'm subscribed to a lot of the mining uh, mining Twitter feeds that I look at, and uh, you can see the huge discrepancy between the price of gold and the actual equities. You can pull up GDX or GDXJ versus last time gold was here at these levels, but they're you know 30 to 50 percent lower prices, even though gold's at new all time highs. So that's one. Um, you mentioned margin. I think last year the mining equity suffered from that because the or last two years actually the cost pressures, costs were rising at a faster rate than the actual commodity itself. The margins were under pressure. But if you look at the last, let's say, you know, 120 days in the sector, gold price is up, what, two to 300 bucks an ounce? There's no way cost have risen by two to three dollars an ounce in the last uh, 90 days. So we're seeing true, you know, margin expansion now from gold price went from 1800 to 2200. And that's typically a very, a very, very good thing for equity. So in general, equities are very, very depressed valuation, the record deficit between the gold price. You mentioned cost pressure, it's true, but the margins now should start to blow out to the positive side. And that should be one of the many catalysts that will get the sector going. Despite, uh, other than the fact that they're dirt cheap, that seeing the cash flows and the margins start to expand will be, will be very positive for the sector as well. So do you think investors are just more interested in tech and artificial intelligence at the moment? Yeah, it reminds me, you know, I, I remind this, this period of time reminds me a lot, 1998, 1999, you know, the dot, the dot com boom. Uh, back then, gold was a four-letter word. Nobody was interested in it. Nobody was interested in anything other than tech back then. The railroads, the commodity stocks, food stocks were really deeply undervalued back then. Everyone was tracing the dot coms, and you know, I'm not saying back then internet was the next big thing, and lo and behold, it was a huge thing. But the, the tech stocks fell 90 percent in 2001, despite the internet be, being even bigger than they thought it was in 1999. So those that are jumping with both hands into AI right now need to be a bit careful. AI is going to be a huge part of our future. It's a, definitely a mega trend, but investors always get way too excited, way too early, and tend to overpay for these themes dramatically early on in the cycle. You can see the chart between you know, NVIDIA and Cisco or NVIDIA and some of the old market leaders from 1999. The chart parallels are, are kind of scary. I can look at the, the parallel between the two. But what that means, every other sector gets ignored. So back then, the old economy stock in the late 90s were considered passe. Warren Buffett was considered to be past his prime and didn't know what he was doing. He was buying all these old economy stocks. Those stocks end up being the best stock in the next 10 years. I, I think a similar playbook, you know, once the tech euphoria starts to fade, once investors start to rotate out of tech or into new sectors, the gold is going to shine very, very brightly just because of the compelling value we talked about, you know, in the first question interview so far today. In the Q1 of every year, we get PDAC, which is the largest mineral explorer uh, conference. We also get BMO. And yeah. I would, I'm assuming you attended those two conferences. What was the sentiment in terms of generalist interest? It, it was amazing, Bill. I mean, I was at the BMO Mining Conference and they they mentioned record attendance, so record number of investors attending, record number of meetings. And I, I, I did 36 meetings in three days myself, mainly with gold producers and emerging producers. And I made a bunch of jokes, same joke a bunch of times at the same meeting, that I really wish that the record attendance here would translate into some actual buying of these shares. So it's kind of like you're at a mall and the mall is packed with, with consumers, but everyone's window shopping and no one's actually going in and making a transaction. So I viewed that as positive, that the the interest level in the sector was there. Uh, but I was also shocked, like I said, I've been doing this for 25 years, Bill. 
every other time I've been to sectors where there's an all new all time high in price. I remember being at oil and gas conferences when the oil hit 140 bucks, you know, pre 2008. And it was party time. There was, you know, everyone was a euphoric mood. The companies are doing big acquisitions. We're borrowing money, doing big buybacks, M and A. It was so subdued, Bill. Like the, the gold producers, you would never have guessed in a million years that the coal was hitting a new all time high. I mean, the companies almost didn't have any answers as to why they were so unloved and so underappreciated. So that to me also tells me, Bill, like the lack of euphoria, the lack of interest, lack of buying, the lack of buzz tells me this rally actually has a lot of like going forward. You typically see that kind of euphoria and buzz at the tops of the market. Like in, when it was 140 bucks, everybody was talking about it. The oil going to go to 200. This is a mega trend. China demand is insatiable. You're not hearing any of that rhetoric at all around gold. I mean, it's really, really quiet, even versus 2020. You know, last time gold was here, I mean, the interest that you see, I think level in gold versus 2020 and today, way stronger in 2020 than it is today. Yet gold's at a higher price. That to me is very, very positive because it means, you know, ETF demand is down, very little ETF financial buying of gold right now, retail participation, institutional participation. It tells me all these buyers are yet to come to the market. So it, it gets me very positive that we, we got a lot of legs left to go here on this, on this potential big rally. When you were speaking with the gold producers, did you ask them what they're looking for currently in a development project that they might purchase? Yeah, I sense a lot of the development, the producers are actually making good money now. So the balance sheets are clean. Uh, this higher gold price means they can generate even more cash flow. I think a lot of them are realizing they've, they've been under a kind of austerity mode since 2015 when the industry was really, really on its knees. So they've paid off all their debt. They've, you know, started paying dividends, cleaned up the balance sheet, focused on free cash flow. A lot of them are realizing now that they're in a, a depleting industry, as you mentioned earlier in this call bill, like that the reserve depletes. So if you don't do something, your reserves and uh, your life as a mining company is going to be in jeopardy. So I think a lot of them are doing uh, a lot of kicking the tires, a lot of interest. We've seen actually a pickup in M&A in the development sector. We've seen bidding wars. Ocino Resources had a bidding war between itself. Uh, so you start to see the the shovel-ready projects that are that are buildable, that are permitted, starting to get a lot of attention. They're getting taken off the board. Fabina got taken out. Uh, Marathon got taken out in Newfoundland. Ocino, like I said earlier. So those they're all getting mopped up. I think that's going to accelerate. And what's really missing, Bill, for a big M&A wave is that the companies, most of them don't have a strong currency to do deals, right? Their stock prices are still subdued. So you want to see the larger cap, the mid cap start to have their stock rise. Then they'll have the paper, the currency to go and do acquisitions to acquire some of these, you know, very, very cheap developers and explore those that are, that are trading for pennies in the dollar in the market today. In the last four years, we have seen a number of complete mine build failures and uh, there's been cost overruns, overrunning timelines. Do you think for a single asset company that wants to develop its own mine currently, like what's the prospects of success? Do you expect to see that more in light of a lot of the failures the last few years? You know, every failure is different, but we have seen success stories. You know, you've seen about some companies have executed properly. I mean, Silvercrest, that's Cheesebook Mine got built, you know, on time and on budget. Uh, you know, G Mining is close. The uh, Equinox Gold, the Greenstone Project is close. What you see there in the, in the success stories, Bill, you see that they have, you know, real strong mine building teams. I think a lot of the mistakes that junior explorer code developers make is the skill set required to go out and you know make an acquisition of early stage property, make a discovery, grill it out, get it to that kind of pre-feasibility level study is a completely different skill set that you need to get a mine built. And a lot of these companies either outsource that work, don't get a deep enough bench, or, or try to cut corners along the way, and they don't realize they're missing certain skill sets to, to succeed on that path, and that's where the mistake happens. So, it, it, it is not an easy thing. It's a completely different skill set versus exploration and development. And some companies get it right. Some companies get it wrong. In the same way, you have to look for the right attributes to have a successful core co-investment. You need a successful developer as well. Part of the problem is that skill sets in short supply. You know, I have, I have a mind filter, a mind builder friend, the business who built multiple mines all around the world. And he says, he told me, you know, Mike, uh, I think copper is going to eight bucks. And I said, oh, what? You really, you're a big bull on demand. He's like, no, no, I, I don't know about demand. I'm just, I'm just a mind builder. He said, you don't have enough A teams in the industry required bring on the supply that they need just he's talking about just about the execution of the, the experience you know 50 year olds that have been doing it for 20 30 years that you need to bring on all this new mine supply he said those guys and girls are in very short supply in terms of what's needed and they're mining ever more challenging deposits lower grade you know lower quality deposits because the really high grade stuff has got mined out the last eight years so you're putting a you know a b or c team on a b or c asset that's a very tough combination to deliver on cost, both in terms of operating cost and capital cost. But his view is that he was just solving the equation for how much supply do we need 
and what's the, the human resources that we need? And he's like, we just don't have it. So that makes me very bullish on commodity prices in general, but it also means you have to be careful because if you have the wrong team on the wrong asset, you can have uh, some big time mishaps here along the way. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of money going into artificial intelligence. Can artificial intelligence applied to the mining sector make up for some of that lack of human talent? That's a good question. I, I don't know enough about building mines to to say how applicable it is. For sure, you're going to have efficiencies. Um, it is still a very manual process building a mine. Um, so I don't think you can just you know tell a computer or a robot to go and do it and do it properly. But I'm sure there's there's going to be some savings and some some synergies and some cost savings there. At the end of the day, it's 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 about I think from my understanding of farming industry close to 25 years. It's about planning, about execution, about de-risking the project as much as possible before you start building the mine. What, what can you figure out in advance before you start spending money? How can you, how can you de-risk the build? How can you get certainty on, on the inputs? Not having changes. Have you ever done renovations before? If you change the scope of your renovation halfway through, that's when the contractor really gets you and, and it can really blow your cost out. So knowing in advance what you want to do, not deviating from that and doing the work in advance, know that you will not have to deviate from the plan are keys to success. So that's a pretty unique skill set. Uh, and so those mind builders are worth, are worth their weight in gold when you have a good one on your team. It's well worth paying for uh, in, in a mining uh, stock opportunity. Michael, I had a, a meeting recently with a company that talked about potentially toll milling or toll mining their deposit. And when you hear that, is it generally a red flag if you hear that, or do you entertain that as a legitimate possibility for a deposit? I'll tell you what, when I, when I look at a, even an Explorco, I'm always looking, even if it's a $10 million junior Explorco, I'm always looking at does this company have what it takes to become a mine? So we've talked, I think we talked about last time we spoke on our, on our last call, Bill, but I would say having mill within the area of your discovery or your project is actually a huge advantage. Whether you end up coal milling or not is one thing, but having mills with excess capacity within trucking distance of your potential project dramatically lowers the economic hurdle required. So let's say you need to make a new greenfield discovery. If you're, if you're operating in an area where there's no infrastructure, no roads, no power, no, no highways, uh, no water, you're going to need you know, multi-million ounce deposit, three, four, five, six million ounces to, to, to justify the investment required to bring infrastructure to that area. If you're operating an area that has existing mills all around you, you, you might be able to have half a million to a million ounces and still have very, very profitable ounces if someone around you either acquires you or you have a coal milling relationship. So coal milling to me, all that means that lowers the infrastructure spend required to turn those, those that ore into cash flow or those ounces into cash flow. Uh, so I'm very uh, I'm very happy when I land in an area where there is excess milling capacity or toll milling opportunities. Now, those that own the toll mills aren't going to give that away for free, but there's always an economic argument where you can say, well, why would I build a second mill when this mill's got excess capacity? There's an economic savings here. Why don't we split the difference down the middle? Both people benefit, and, and you don't uh, go through the time and permitting process putting a second mill in place. So I'm very very favorable to those situations. They're they're quite they're quite positive in my view. When you're looking at development stories, especially in a depressed market like we are in the gold stocks, when does a potential value play or perceived value play become a value trap? Because I've had a lot of friends that have bought development stocks based on the gold ounces in the ground over the last few years, and they, they have not done very well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the it's not it's not a dirty secret. The the reality is is that out of you know 500 mining projects, maybe one or two will actually become a mine. So. I'm not sure you call that a value trap, but just a trap would be that most projects that you look at will never become a mine. And so, yeah, that's where I've tried to sharpen my skill set and, and and get in contact with people that know a lot more than I do about mining and, and building mines. When you when you have a project that graduates from a discovery to a developer, when they're in that PEA or pre feasibility study, even those projects, most of them will not become mines. So you've really got to be able to say, is this a mine? in an average commodity price environment. The goal is $2,200 today. I think it might go much higher the next years to come. But let's say, can your mine be a mine at $1,600 gold or $1,500 gold? Is it you know that tier one cost, low cost curve? Does it have the capital intensity that's low enough that you can build this mine even in a medium or depressed commodity price environment? And does it have all the geological attributes, the metallurgy, the infrastructure, all those things that can kill projects? If they tick all the boxes, it'll become a mine. And then if you're in a bad market, you can just be patient knowing that asset will get developed or will get the capital needs over time. So one of the best mistake investors make is they hang on to assets that will never become a mine. And therefore they're waiting for a bull market in the commodity to lift all boats and potentially make money. But the reality is that project is not, is not a mine. Another mistake investors make is you have a mine, but you're in a bear market and they've improperly financed it. 
So you either, as you mentioned earlier, CapEx blows out, uh, you massively dilute your stock. You start life as a two, three dollar stock, and then you run out of money, and you raise money the dollar or fifty cents, and then all of a sudden you're, you're you have a mine, but you've issued so many shares along the way uh, due to cap structure or mismanagement of the balance sheet that your investors don't make any money. So you, not only do you have to have a project that is a mine that has the the skills or the actual attributes that become a mine, but you've also got to manage your balance sheet and your cap structure such that when you build the mine, investors actually make money, and you navigate the cycle so you don't get diluted at the lows. So. There's a lot of moving parts. So that's why on, on a on a successful mining investment, you gotta have the asset. You gotta have the the professional team, so the geologists and the mine builders, engineers to execute properly. And you gotta have the capital markets expertise to know when it's time to raise money, when it's time to slow down, not to get over your skis and, and navigate that as well. All those three things together result in a winning investment. So it's not it's not an easy game. Um so you gotta have all the if you do get it right, you'll you'll do tremendously well in the sector, but there's a lot of pitfalls along the way. So you got to be, you got to be aware of those potential uh, potholes uh, on the road to success. Michael, if you're given a binary decision and you had to choose between an A plus deposit, so ge- geological or an A plus management team, which one would you choose and why for a junior pre-production? Hands down the A plus asset because you, you can't change mother nature. You can't change geology. Um, if you own enough stock, you can't change management. So I think a caveat that answer that I would say, yeah, the, the A plus assets, the slam dunk is going to be a mine for sure are extremely rare assets. If you get your hands around them at the right price, those are the most coveted thing you can own. Now, if the management team is, is toxic or, or really, you know, bad apples, let's say, then you got to be sure that you can come in there and, and clean up, clean up the, the team. Otherwise they can destroy a lot of value. Uh, so, but I, I'd always choose the asset over the management team. Like I said, one can be changed, the other one cannot. Okay, a follow-up binary question. If you were forced to choose between taking on political risk or geological technical risk, which one would you choose? That's a good question. Um, if the geological or technical risk means that the project is never going to be built or will never become a mine, then I take the political risk. Ideally, I have a, a you know an A-plus mine or a mine I think is going to be a mine in an area where I have less risk politically. But but again, I would I would definitely choose the geology over the politics because again, at the end of the day, you know, if you don't have an economic mine, you could you could have the best land package in the world and the best jurisdiction, but if there's no mineable deposit on it, it's not worth anything, right? So you want to start with the geology, start with the opportunities of, could this be a mine? And then, you know, there's other reasons why you might say no, um, but I always start with that. So you believe the gold price is going much higher. You've been saying that for quite a number of years. In that situation where you also see the gold producers at low valuations, why not just buy the gold producers because you know they're going to go up rather than tinker with the the juniors like you do? Yeah, I mean, I'd say this. I mean, I started investing in gold in 2019. I mean, I've been investing my whole life in it, but I put a lot of my personal net worth in the gold sector in, in 2018, 2019. Gold was like 1100 and 1300 when I started. I, I mentioned how I've never been in a conference where gold at all-time highs and I've seen investors so subdued. I've never been so right about a commodity call in my career and not been so richly rewarded yet. So uh, I think I think gold is is going a lot higher. I've been consistently saying that. I've been I've been you can go look back at all my issues last three four or five years and been pretty consistent. My my macro thesis continues to play out almost to a T in terms of you know excess government government debt fueled spending, uh, de dollarization, uh, you know the hard money needing to really assert itself and going forward. Those things continue to play out beautifully. The gold price is playing out beautifully. If the stocks haven't fallen yet, so that's speaks earlier my earlier point is a huge opportunity uh, in in the sector. Uh, producers versus explorers, obviously explorers are way riskier. It's all about how much leverage or upside work you want. So, you know, gold goes from 2000 to 2500, the producers will all be up 50 to hundred percent, quite, quite across the board. The explorer codes are ones that can go up 10 to 30 times your money. So, you know, thousand to 3000 percent, but your failure rates can be very high. So you're going to have a bunch of them that go to zero. So it really depends on how much risk you're willing to take. And also depends on where you are in the cycle. At some points in the cycle, the producers may be very expensive, and the juniors might be very cheap. Or the juniors can get really, really expensive in a, in a bull market, and the producers are less so. So, I'm a bottom-up valuation guy. My my first uh, disciples investing with Warren Buffett, you know. So, like, I had that valuation sensitive, you know, intrinsic value approach to a very speculative, hard to value sector. But I'm very, very cognizant always of what I'm paying, whether it's a five million dollar micro cap at Florico, or it's a three billion dollar mid cap producer, I'm always looking for the best, you know, risk reward for my money. So it's a hard question to answer, but I would say pork would be why you'd go down market cap. But make sure your viewers have the stomach for volatility if they do that, because it's gonna be a lot of a lot of wild swings along the way in the juniors for sure. 
the last six years or so, you've been more of an activist investor in, with when you invest in the junior sector. How much of is choosing to invest in the juniors and not some of the bigger companies, the, the element of enjoyment of the process, not just potential returns? Depends on how involved you are. I mean, I, I enjoy building things. Or did you get a... involved because you had to? <laughs> No, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, you mentioned earlier, like the A plus assets. When when you find a when you find a great asset that you believe can be a mine, sometimes it's missing some of the soft stuff around it. Maybe it needs a better board. Maybe it needs a little more capital market savvy. Maybe it needs a stronger technical team. Uh, maybe it needs uh, a refinancing or a, a new broker support or Wall Street support. So when I get involved with a proactive investor, I'm like, I'm not looking to you know be a pain in the butt. Because I want to be a pain. It's more what can I, what can I bring to the table? What how can I help this company be better? And as you know, I always invest large positions in the companies I invest in. You know, anywhere from five to twenty percent of the company. So coming as an equity holder, going, I'll make money if the stock works. I'm, I don't have all the answers. Not always right, but what what can we add to the story here to give investors a better chance of having a successful outcome? And so that's that's why I've gotten involved. Uh, I also do enjoy building things, being an entrepreneurial type person myself. You know, being involved in building companies from the ground up, uh, making decisions, uh, making hopefully the right decisions for shareholders, navigating through tough markets like we're in now or or bull markets, and there's a lot of ways to add value in both those type of markets, right? So, it, it is a it is time consuming, uh, but when you have a big equity stake in it, it's motivating, and, and I think it wish more management teams had more alignment with shareholders. I think there'd be better outcomes for shareholders. That, shareholders, if that was the case. For a pre-production Canadian executive, sub one hundred million dollar market cap, what would be a reasonable salary in terms of a cash and equity? My my dream, you know, Bill would be that they own so much stock in the company they're happy to work for a dollar. You know, like that's that is sort of the ideal situation where, yeah, you can't pay someone a dollar a year. Not everybody's Rob McEwen though, right? Not everybody no, exactly. has his net worth. But- <laughs> But I, I'd hope that they have enough equity in the business, shares in the company, that their salary is secondary in their thought process to wanting the stock to work out. So if I'm paying a CEO $100,000, but he owns a million dollars worth of stock in the business, you know, a 10% move in the stock higher equals his annual salary. Whereas some situations I see you're paying the CEO $350,000 and they own 20,000 shares worth 5,000 bucks and a bunch of options. So in that case, the salary is the driving force and the stock options are the driving force and they're not thinking or aligned like shareholders. So I don't think it's a right or wrong salary, but I, I really desire to see alignment uh, with shareholders so that they think like a shareholder when things get tough, like now, and for many companies are in a, in a tough space, the markets are not really open for financing right now. Managers worry about dilution. They're worried about diluting themselves, right? Not worried about paying their salaries. They're worried about diluting the shareholders and that, which they are a large one. So, you know, I, I mean, there's ranges of consultants that tell you what the right salary to pay, but I always prefer lower salaries and more equity. Even when, I, when I'm structuring the compensation packages on the boards that I'm on, I'm looking for managed teams like, okay, I, I want a little less cash up front, but I, I want to take more equity or more options in the business. I want to participate alongside like an owner. Uh, it's, they're not cash flowing businesses, you know, Bill. So we don't have the luxury as an industry to pay our management teams, you know, big, big cash flowing salaries when you don't generate cash yourself. So again, the equity alignment is, is, is a very important part of the puzzle for me when you talk about compensation for management. Michael, I'm about uh, eight and a half years into investing in junior mining stocks, so not quite where you are. But along the way, especially with the YouTube channel and such, I get a lot of feedback from retail investors. And I heard you say something to where investors should look at what they're doing, especially in the smaller juniors, as a venture capitalist. And I can tell you that many of the retail investors, based on comment and feedback that I've gotten, they don't look at it like that. They expect a return, not fully realizing their return could be zero. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've said it before. Yeah, and, and probably the reason that a lot of retail investors don't understand what the venture capital model really is. So, you know, tech into the tech sector, the venture capital model or the biotech sector is very well uh, diffused and very well understood. It's a sector where you buy twenty-five to fifty stage early stage technology companies, putting in maybe you know institutional investor put a million dollars in each, let's say, right, twenty-five to fifty million, fifty dollar, fifty check a million bucks each, twenty-five to fifty million dollars, and one of them may become Amazon or Facebook or Google. The other 49 likely end up being failures because all these businesses like the mining sector consume cash, they burn capital, they're, they're proof of concept type ideas, and most of them don't make it to commercialization or don't ever get to that final stage. But the Google or Facebook or, or Instagram they end up buying ends up being worth 150 or 200 times your money 
and that pays for the return of the whole portfolio. What I see a lot of retail investors do is they watch Bill Powers on, on YouTube or they watch me on YouTube or they hear me talk about one stock and they go put half their money in that one stock. Not understanding that it's a portfolio of juniors where if you're not diversified owning you know, 15, 20, 30 names, the likelihood of you finding a, a mine is low You know, if you're only buying one or two stocks. So that venture capital model is, is the right way to approach uh, junior exploration investing. You've got to have enough diversification to spread your bets. And you also have to... I like to be very sensitive on valuation. So what I love about the model now, if you're, if you're a venture investor in tech right now, any AI startup that comes to get funding, they got a PowerPoint presentation and a guy that knows how to code and do AI, you probably got a $50 million valuation for a piece of paper. He's got no business or she's got no business, but they're just in the right space. And everyone's falling over each other to fund these companies. So the valuations are very, very high. Whereas in the mining space right now, things are so depressed. You can get a company that's already made a discovery in a great jurisdiction, maybe with milk close by and maybe some proven reverses or reserves that are essentially on their way to becoming a mine for like a five to $10 million valuation. So your your entry price is so much lower that you're gonna get more bets on the on the, on the casino, more more tips on the table, let's speak, for the same amount of money versus tech where you're gonna have to overpay and you're still gonna be losing 90% of your money in tech, but you're starting on a much higher valuation. So your downside is much, much more pronounced. So. I've been encouraging a lot of tech investors that I talk to that I know, like, hey, if you guys have done well in VC investing in tech, you will have the perfect mindsets for mining investing. But they're just so obsessed with what's made them rich is, is tech. Not understanding that periods like 2001 also happened where tech just rolled off a cliff. You may be what are off being diversified into another sector, which is providing a much better risk reward, similar upside, but a much, much lower entry cost. So your returns are going to be significantly higher uh, in mining exploration stocks than they are going to be metric capital tech from here, is my, is my firm belief. Getting tech guys or girls to do that is another another story, but I think it's it's definitely something worthwhile exploring or thinking about if you're in that space. The reality of what you just described, you like to overlay that over the understanding of the Lasan curve, don't you? I've heard you talk about this because you said the greatest gains don't necessarily come from the Lasan curve. They could on an individual company basis, but the rising tide, what you just described, that's what especially newer investors should focus on, shouldn't they? Yeah, in all humility, I, I don't have the gravitas to tie Pierre Lasson's shoelaces. He's had a huge, successful career, but I, but I have a lot of respect for his Lasson curve. But I just want to adapt how I think about investing is, you know, the Lasson curve will shift up and down depending on where you are in the cycle. And the best example would be the lithium space. You know, two years ago, lithium went from what, $10,000 to $80,000 a ton, right? And every single lithium stock went up from, you know, 100% to 1,000%. So you, on the Lasson curve, it says, you know, expiration, pre discovery, discovery, resource build out, pre-feasibility, you know, mine build and the back up the cash flow. So the analogy I did is a pre-discovery, you know, green field. I bought, I got a bunch of moose pasture in Canada here. I want to drill it out. I'm looking for lithium or I've got a bunch of moose pasture I'm drilling for gold. Two years ago, lithium was red hot. That pre-discovery lithium story maybe had a $50 million market cap and the same risk reward in a gold sector had a $5 million market cap. So my point was, yes, I want to invest on the long curve, but I know very well the chance of either of those companies making the discovery is relatively low, but the fall from $50 million to zero is a lot steeper than $5 million to zero. So I could buy 10 junior Explorico gold companies at $5 million each, get 10 shots on gold for that same $50 million investment, or I could buy one lithium Explorico. Only difference was one sector was red hot and one was depressed. So what I've said publicly is I like to invest in sectors where sentiment is depressed, like we are right now in gold where the outlook for the commodity is very robust. Rarely do you get the opportunity to buy when sentiment's depressed and the commodity price already is robust and the outlook is quite positive going forward. And that's an incredible risk reward. So I stay away from the red hot sectors. I only started taking lifting meetings about two months ago. The lifting price has gone down from 80,000 a ton back to 10,000 a ton. So now I'm back looking, the sentiment's pretty poor right down with this space. But that, that's a bit of my MO. Kind of in commodities, you gotta be contrarian, you gotta be counter cyclical, but don't just buy coming is down. You know, buy when the commodity is out of favor, but you have a thesis that says, I think the commodity is going to get better from here. And the market is not either buying it yet or not bought into that thesis yet. That's where you can get incredible value. And then manage the Lafon curve to, you know, optimize your wealth generation, but you're going to get way better entry, entry points and, and uh, risk reward trades if you, if you follow that approach. Michael, considering for an early stage project, you said to uh, focus on geology and if the geology is great, get excited. But what happened if a particular entity that that project is in has a lot of baggage to it and maybe some bad management? Like at what point is there so many warts on this thing that you don't want to touch it? Sure. I mean, one thing that when you talk about baggage, there's a lot of 
there's a lot in there, a lot of baggage in the baggage. Um, I would say one thing that I look at very closely is the cap structure. So, you know, sometimes these mining stores get created where the founders will give themselves, let's say there's 40 million shares outstanding, there's, you know, 25 million shares created a penny each, and then they do their IPO at 25 cents. So there's 50 million shares sold at 25 cents and 25 million shares sold at a penny or given to the management at a penny. Well, when the stock has success and go public, guess what? When the stock's trading at 30, 35 cents, you got 60% of your shareholders, 25 million shares sitting on paper with a one cent cost basis. So they're they're very motivated to sell at any price between 35 cents and a penny, they're making money. Whereas the average shareholder coming in is down, but most shareholders in the deal have got money. Very, so the cap structure, who owns the stock? What do they pay for the paper? How clean is it? Who owns it? Right? Are, are you, have, you have fast money hedge funds in there? Do you got a lot of warrants in the structure, which makes it hard for the stock to trade? Um, do they, they take flow through money in Canada, which is money that, you know, is tax motivated buying typically would want to sell to buy a new flow through share in the future. So I look very closely at, at the share structure. When I get involved in a company or I'm um, creating a new company, I want a very tight structure with strong handed shareholders that have all got in, you know, at a similar basis to the guys or, and girls you're asking money for in the initial IPO. Obviously you make a discovery and the stock goes up. That's perfectly fair. That's, that's normal. But early on, what's the cap structure? With management on a lot of stock. Are they paying themselves appropriate salaries given the business doesn't cash flow? Is the board qualified? Do they have all the technical skill we talked about earlier? So, you know, certain stories, I'll look at them and go, yeah, there's great geology, but this is, this is, there's too many negatives stacked up on the soft, you know, qualitative side of things for me to, to want to roll up my sleeve and, and maybe make changes there. So I'll just pass, right? So ideally it's a great geology and a good jurisdiction with a management team that aligned properly and the cap structure is proper. Sometimes you can't get it all. And then you go, okay, what can I, what can I change? Uh, what can I what can I improve here? But I do. If you tick all the boxes, that's typically when I'm getting my checkbook out, write a write a check right away. Would you consider investing in a private company right now, or are there too many good publicly traded opportunities? I do invest in private companies. Uh, my perception has because the market's been in a bear market. I'd say the average private company has delusional expectations of what their company is worth. So it's actually been an advantage, kind of perversely, to be a private company the last two years because being a public company. You've seen your stock prices beating down the market, you know, lack of liquidity, lack of buying. So a lot of the public companies are trading at, you know, really, really depressed valuations. So I have a lot of deals where I'll see a private company comes to me and say, Hey, we're, we're doing the free IPO private round. You want to get involved? So what's the valuation of $25 million? And I go, well, I can show you four or five other public companies that are more advanced than you have a larger resource, a potential larger opportunity. They're trading at $7 million valuations, the market today. So why would I pay $25 million for your company? They say, well, our last round was at 20. Or 22, we want to do an upround. I go, well, that's nice that you want to do that, but the public market is telling you you're worth seven. And at a private company, you don't have the the market voting machine, the, the automatic uh, response where you see the market where your stock's being valued today. So I find more value in the public space today. In a ripping bull market, it's different. The, the juniors will be trading at very big valuations in the market. Maybe you can get a private company at a, at a discounted valuation, hopes that it goes public and gets catch up to its peers. But right now, I think the tables are turned, they're inverted. You get much more value in the public market in general than you do in the private market. Do you have your exit strategy for a lot of the junior gold companies you're in already set in terms of the gold price? When gold hits a certain price point, you're going to just start to sell some of your juniors? No, because if I mean, gold, if you told me in 2018 or 2019 that gold would be $2,200, I, I would have thought my, my juniors would be way higher priced than they are today. So it's not so much based on the gold price. Uh, for, for me, because I invest such large percentage stakes in companies, Bill, I really have that venture capitalist mindset which my exit strategy is going to be on an, on an acquisition of the company, like a take out a liquidity event or a discovery that becomes so clear that it becomes a, you know, mid cap stock, two, three, four, five hundred, six hundred million dollar market cap because the market, you know, realizes that this is a the project picked all the boxes is going to be a mine. So I'm not looking for liquidity when I make an investment. I'm looking for like a three to 10 year horizon, you know, when I'm getting involved in something. It's why it's very important to me that I time the cycle so that I have the wind at my back for most of that, most of that, that, uh, that period. But I'm not looking for uh, an in and out in and out trade. Obviously, if the gold price goes higher, eventually the, the stocks will catch up, and that'll be a moment where liquidity and valuations increase. Majors can do more M and A, and more liquidity events will be created. But I, I'm really thinking more of a, a private equity venture capital type mindset when I invest. I'm not looking for for day to day liquidity in the stocks that I that I buy. So basically, you're not going to be eking shares out of the market, especially when you have to publicly report that and you've made your name associated with a lot of these juniors. You're going to win or fail with the company. 
Correct. And, and I, I co-invest when I, when I ask people to invest, my, my pitch is very simple. I'm always the largest investor in the company. So when I'm calling my network, asking them, would they like to invest alongside me? I'm always very clear about my, my timeline. It's a three to a three to 10 year timeline. Um, very clear on my view of the sector being the window that's back. Commodity price will be positive. Valuation should increase. But yeah, I'm not looking to the, the companies that get big behind the five twenty percent positions where I'm on the board or advisor or I'm top top shell of the company. It's it's a liquidity event. When when management wins, when the shareholders win, we'll all win together. That's sort of my approach uh, to investing in this space. Michael, what is your observations about marketing junior mining stocks over the last six years as you, as you focused intensively on this sector? And what would you like to see changed, if anything? I think it's I'm use some diverse advice. I think in the bear market the junior mining some of them spend way too much money on marketing so you're you're you kind of you know you're, you're spending money for nothing in certain environment when there's no interest in the sector when there's no retail appetite for the sector doing a big half a million dollar retail promotion where you're all over social media and internet and you know doing road shows the hair left and right and center uh you're not getting any traction and so you're you're probably better off preserving your precious dollars to go on the ground or, or avoid dilution for your shoulders other companies don't do anything on marketing and then they're punished for that because they don't have any visibility and they do have a good project and when the market turns nobody knows who they are so on the boards i'm on i'm, I'm very cognizant about roi you know if we if we are if you are doing marketing to either retail or social media or institutional conferences you know who's going to be there a, a lot of companies go to conferences where you know there are no buyers of 20 million dollar market cap companies at that conference, they, they spend 20 grand to go to the conference anyway, and they get three meetings and no one there is going to buy their stock. You're better off finding out where is the audience for my story? You know, who are the buyers of my story? Who, who are individual investors that are buying stock? And try to find them either at conferences or online or one-on-one to, to create interest in the company. And, and these days, a lot of your marketing can be done quite effectively getting your story out. You know, it's, it's, it's YouTube's free, a lot of stuff. So you can, you, can get, you can get the right material out there in the market. In a bull market, where there's a lot of audience and a lot of interest in the sector, that's probably when you want to step on the gas and, and get more visibility because your return on those marketing dollars will be will be very fruitful and will result in you know more buying and a higher market cap for your company. So it's really about being a good steward and being really really smart with the money investors give you. And, and if there's no return there, you know don't, don't spend the money. If the, if the sun is shining, then go out there and and uh, and make sure investors are aware of your story. Other than gold, any commodity you could leave us with that you're interested in. I still like copper quite a bit. Um, I think copper, the producers are getting, you know, a little bit of love in the market, but the, the junior explorer codes and the developers are, are not. So I think there's an opportunity there for copper. Uh, the contrarian in me says that nickel is quite interesting. This nickel has gotten really bearish, uh, based on some, some action that Indonesia has taken, but I think the price has now fallen to a point where probably below the, the cash cost of some major nickel producers in the world. So you're going to see supply shut in. And I think you're still going to need nickel in the future. So nickel is a contrarian bet. I'm not 100% fold on lithium yet, but the but the pullback in lithium at least got me taking meetings again and looking looking at the sector. But I think that, that's an embottoming process that can take a while. Uh, I still think gold is probably hands down the best risk reward that we have in the market today in terms of valuation and, and upside and it's where the stock are trading. But they're, but in general, the commodities are, are very undervalued. See our comments on tech, like the, the commodities are at 20, 30 year lows versus the F&P. Uh, so there's huge value in this space in general, uh, but gold remains my preferred, preferred location right now. Would that be about 80% of your portfolio, gold equities? Probably, yeah. I'd say 70, 80% gold and probably 20, 30%, you know, copper, copper, zinc, nickel, the other, other, other base metal. But yeah, gold remains uh, heavily, heavily weighted in my, in my portfolio today. Excellent. So, Michael, if uh, listeners want to follow you, is it just the periodic uh, appearance on YouTube, such as a show like this, or is there any other way they can follow your work? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty busy. I have my head down working most days, so I'll do I'll do the occasional interview, uh, maybe once a quarter. Uh, in your case, once a couple of years, we don't have to wait two years for the next one, Bill. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have a Twitter handle yet, uh, but everything I do is on YouTube. But you said um, you're lurking on Twitter, I heard you say, right? <laughs> I read Twitter. I like I like reading it. I find it some interesting okay. stuff, and I have a pretty customized feed that I look for. But uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't post. I'm not looking for social media notoriety. I'm, I'm looking for uh, returns, and, and uh, I'd rather spend my time talking to companies and, and building businesses that are on YouTube too much. But I do like enjoying these things, so all investors can get my my point of view at once. Uh, and, uh, and I do enjoy talking about the sector. I'm very passionate about the space, and I think it's a huge opportunity ahead for investors uh, in the year ahead here. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you for coming on Mining Stock Education. My pleasure, Bill.